All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Dead TV Live. <laughs> And uh, in the studio, I have a guest. Why don't you introduce yourself to me? Because it's the first time we've really met. Hey, how are you? I'm Anton. Hey, Andrew. Andrew. Andrew's in uh, MGMT. And uh, I don't know. We have, we have a couple of common things. We're both friends with Sonic Boom to a certain degree, right? Yeah, I think it's... So let's, let's start out with, with a good question. How did that, that come up? up? Apart, or should we start from the beginning? Let's we'll start way back. <laughs> what what got you interested in playing music? Oh man, that, let's start further up. Let's start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> These are questions I love. Okay. Um. When did you guys start the band? We started. We were 19 years old, and we started. We were in college. And we were just playing around on a laptop, that kind of thing. Yeah, making some stuff up, having a good time. Yes. And then um, all right. So, how long were you a group before you started sending out demos or you got attention from your live shows or something, playing concerts? We didn't get any attention from our live shows because we were just playing it on college, at college campus shows. And then we just, um, we had like an EP that we put out and then the, an A&R woman at the label heard it and she kind of, we ended up signing. What's her name? Maureen Kenny. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay, now here, here's a question I have. You know, you guys, uh, there's like points of references. Even you, you know, I'm friends with Anthony Osgang and all that stuff mm -hmm. too. And um, you guys like mix up a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because I'm so busy with my own stuff and all uh, everything, you know, I'm not the Jack Black, John Cusack type. I don't sit around and chat about <laughs> other people's stuff. You know, like I'm my own radio head as yeah. much as, you know. That stuff. I did catch one of your guys' videos. I think it was from not this new record, but the one before, right as your thing was breaking. I think Katie and I were in the UK and we were watching one, and I was just like, this is how you do it. What prompted you to sort of like, you know, you're a young person, you kind of like have a whole basket of your influences and these art things that you enjoy and these people, mm -hmm. like having Sonic be a part of it or whatever. Did you meet any resistance from the label about you guys being the kind of? Well, it was it's weird because we didn't, we weren't really setting out from the beginning, beginning to sign to a big label, and we weren't really putting our stuff out there as much as other bands do. We didn't really like go through and like pay our dues like a lot of bands, and and so um, and so that kind of for us kind of gave us the freedom to kind of just do whatever we want because we didn't really. We weren't really risking, like, you know, it wasn't right. like our big dream to be on a major label. Very and so cool. we, we wanted to, like, use the ability to reach a lot of people to kind of just do it by, you know, making so it. So cool, I gotta say that right yeah. now. You know, my major beef is not that people are rich, but it's so amazing right now that, like, people with any kind of world and resources have zero imagination. <laughs> you know, so it's very cool that you got in touch with some people with some resources and you were able to work with some people that you wanted to work with. How about yeah. So, uh, Sonic did one. Who did the earlier stuff producing? Well, both albums we worked with Dave Fridman. Okay, yeah. Um, and sure, Dave. You know, Pete was there mixing with us at, at Tarbox Studios um, in 2009 when we were finishing up the last record. And um, that was weird because we didn't really know how Pete and Dave Fridman were going to get along. along. But it actually worked out really well. Cool. You know, and, uh, Pete gets a little bit weird sometimes when he's uncomfortable yeah. in any situation. I had the same kind of situation come up too in band dynamics or something. Like, I don't want to tell everybody necessarily to do what it, I, I know is the right thing. Like, I don't want to be that guy, even though it's actually obvious. But sometimes that's the weird dynamic of leadership. Like, I only want to be a leader just to get something done, not yeah. because I crave power. I think we were really, like, um, kind of intimidated by meeting Sonic Boom before we knew him and like kind of we're imagining him to be this kind of like just like uber Aww. uber cool like I don't know like I don't think we ever suspected that we would connect so much on the kind of like personal goofy yeah. kind of like like he's like all about like puns and like we're like we're like we get, our humor is really similar and he's a, he a, a really big fan of pop music yeah. and like just like pop culture and so I think it was a really good kind of pairing. Now, you know, you seem to have a really good head on your shoulders and stuff. Um, what do you do when people come up to you and they're... For me, there's a lot of people that always want to talk to me. But 
I'll talk at it, <coughs> and I find that they'll talk to me about me, I never learn anything <coughs> about them. So they've just become that part of the blur of people I know nothing about. I mm -hmm. find like if we're just talking about any old thing, then you know, I know something about that person. But if they're just going on and on about my group, then I already know more about my group than they will ever know. So I'm not interested yeah. in their take on it or even their perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, how do you interact? Because you guys, uh, I mean, people like you. And what, how do you interact when people come up to you want to talk to you about your music or something? I don't know. I mean, I think we try to be like, I think, you know, we're really uh, grateful for uh, the, the people that really appreciate what we're doing with our music, and yeah. you know, I think we're not, we don't, we don't ever try to like, you know, brush people off or just kind of. I don't, did you ever see Sunset Boulevard? Mm -mm. It's a movie with uh, William Holden and uh, Norma Desmond, I guess, with uh, 1920s actress, silent actress, and, and Eric von Sturheim's in it. But mm -hmm. one of the interesting things is she's this uh, silent movie actress, and of course, it's shot in the 50s, and she's living up in mansion and her former director is like writing fake fan mail and she's lives, you know, isolated. She still thinks that every, her adoring part. There was a weird thing where people always have this hang up, you know, about talking to people. Like we saw uh, Katie bumped into Kid Rock next door at Bassey and he was like hiding behind the bar and nobody was even bothering him. Yeah. It's like this weird disconnect. That's kind of like the New York people live in New York attitude when they see somebody like, no, like, 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 like we saw Kid Rock and um <laughs> No, like he always had this guy, um, like his like kind of minder guy that was like so much shorter than him, who was like carrying his coat. And if he went to the bathroom, like anyway, this guy was following him. And so I was drunk, and my friend Brody came in. And he was like, "Kid, no, listen up. Somehow now, somehow." Up. He's like, "Oh, Kid Rock is over there." I'm like, "No way." So I was so drunk, I went up to him. And I was like, "Are you Kid Rock?" And he's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Are you really sleazy?" And he's like, "Have I met you before?" And I'm like, "No." He tried to shake my hand. I'm like, I'm not shaking your hand, but I know your real name. And he's like, fine, well, Bob, me, I. But he was really cool, but like, like I'm saying, like everyone in Berlin, like nobody cares like who you are. Everyone's just like, yeah. A kid rock had this like, guy like carrying his coat, like running after him, like wherever he went. <laughs> Odd. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, don't Sorry. Be sorry. <laughs> um. So that's just a very surreal experience. <laughs> well, we got Cam Kitty on camera. She normally doesn't like to be a part of any of this. Um, have you found it? <laughs> that part? <laughs> it's cool. Did, have you, did you... Uh, what was Japan like for you? Japan? I don't know. It's like a different planet, sort of. We played at the liquid room. I think it was closed down before you guys were banned. Yeah, but it was been there. pretty amazing in Shinjuku. But, you know, there were people waiting for days quietly in the hotel and they wouldn't even come up yeah. to ask for your autograph. They just want to see you coming and going. They're like super polite. Yeah, there's really people that be there like, there's people that be at the airport and then when you get to the hotel, they're there too. Like they beat you from the airport to the hotel. Crazy. Um, like they have some special driver <laughs> service. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so what brings you to Europe right now? Uh, we're just touring continuing the tour and um, Where's your next show? We're playing tomorrow night at Columbia Hala. In Berlin. In Berlin. And we've been in Scandinavia. It's been going great. Yeah, um, we were, Katie and I were just in Denmark. Yeah, that's where we were last night. Yeah, we were there too, but we flew over here. We go back this morning. Yeah. Copenhagen is cool. We're on tour with this band Smith Westerns who are really yeah, cool. Yeah, Yeah. Named after a band. Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. Kind of. Kind of. And how's that been going? Pretty good decent? Pretty decent, yeah. Um, I think that the, the beginning of this year was tough for us when the record came out because pressure. Well, just I, we kind of like just like completely uh, didn't think about the repercussions of doing whatever we wanted to do and like recording it album with Pete Kimber and whatever and people and then like uh, to, people were just catching on to what you did last the yeah year before and that can be tough because they didn't want to hear it right yeah and it was kind of the whole second album thing and. Uh, you know, we got a lot, a lot of negative press and stuff, but and we're pretty sensitive dudes, so that was that was tough. But I think that we we really uh, stayed stayed strong this year. But I think that's what and happens with the press. Like can I finish this, Kitty, please? Uh, <laughs> no, check this out. Uh, and the label, do you feel like the, they're still committed and behind you guys, believing you? I think they're committed. Yeah, I think that um, I think that uh, 
they didn't really know how to market our second album. They don't know how to do anything almost. They're still working in the kind of old paradigm. Paradigm. Yeah. And we were trying to, you know, put out our album and say people can download it for free and, and it just kind of wasn't working. But they are very supportive of what we're doing and I think that um, you know, we're excited to like keep recording and doing our thing. And, that's all I wanted to hear from yeah. you, really. You know what I mean? It's uh, What I want you to keep in mind is if I took any of the advice that was given to me on a professional level in the music business, I would be out of business. All of my peers, they can't post their own music. Jesus and Mary Jean can't put up a YouTube of their own music. They yeah. signed away that with their publishing. Yeah. They have zero power. Everybody on creation, all of them. It's just amazing. You know, all this stuff. And the other weird thing is, you know, I've had my job as an artist longer than anybody, even the lawyers, mm -hmm. at any of those labels. So it's really weird at the magazines or any of the, any of that stuff. It's really weird to take advice from people that are just passing through. Yeah, it's true. But um, so I really, when you said that you plan to, you know, carry on, and you're adjusting to that, the the environment as you as you you know, all these things as they pop up. I think that's really encouraging outlook because a lot of people, you know. Um, when they try and do something and it doesn't work out, then they become dis discouraged. Like a lot of people, they'll sign a record deal and it doesn't work out, and then that project will get, will get tied up. And at that point, they're like, fuck it, I don't even want to make another record for anybody else. Yeah, when, that's happened too. When like their dreams get crushed. Yeah. Well, now, what. Go ahead, Katie. No, I didn't put me on camera. So well, what I was going to say. We are recording an interview point. right now. You are going to be on camera, whether it's your voice, so might as well be your picture. I Go know ahead. what I was going to say, like when you have the first record and it gets really popular, then for the second record, like I'm with the negative press, then you are, it's going to be kind of difficult for the second record, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, but that's that's all planned in there. Uh, most most groups, what happens is when they when they show the A and R people their little things. There's usually a song that that are a couple songs that people really just love, and then what happens is you show them all, the producer and the label. You show them this whole pile of songs, and they go, "Well, we're just going to use these eleven. And then the second record, you know, if you're the Strokes, second and third record is the bits that they didn't use on the first one because you find you get so busy that you're probably not going to be writing. It's not the same as those five years, you know, with your four track or whatever. We've, we've tried to get past that by only giving them... New stuff. Well, only only recording, like, nine songs. God, ten clever. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, stupid, but, like, we, yeah. we don't have any extra material, anything. It's not stupid that you should care about what you're doing <laughs> enough to try and find a creative angle to not make some of the mistakes that other people have obviously blared. So they, they don't have any, like, selection... Yeah, they don't have anything like, else, right? This is what we have. It's 40 minutes long, and that's our album. And yeah. let's take it or leave it for it. Uh, Luckily, they haven't been like, okay, we'll, see, I like you, you guys already. go back into a studio with another producer or something. You know? I like you already. Um, I, you know what's really interesting, too, about your guys' situation? You know, there's a lot of bands where they just go, well, you're these new guys with this new idea. We're going to have this fake indie label for you to be on. Yeah, but you don't have any of that pretense like some of these other jokers. Well, no, I mean they wanted to do that. They they wanted to put out our music, uh, the first album on something. I think it was called like Red or something. Yeah, well, Red Distribution. I deal with those guys in North Carolina. We were like, no, we we actually like Columbia Records and like we like a lot of sure bands that came out on Columbia. Of course, and, like, Bob Dylan. You know, and we wanted our you know CD to be like the old school yeah, Columbia label. Sure. So, I think you know we weren't trying to hide the fact that we were on a major label. Right. Thing. It all just depends on your experience, right? Yeah. Sorry about the, I'm the madman um, with the table's a mess. No, I, I like it. I just, uh, <laughs> I just don't quit. Okay, so, um, how long is this tour going to last? When are you guys thinking about recording again? When are you going to come to Berlin and come to our new studio? It's gonna be I heard about I was talking to Will downstairs. Yeah, he's the foreman. He's he the said that man. he was describing some, you know, like well, the hell, it's like the... Was the first floor of the stores. studio, and then yeah. the next is just abandoned up there. It sounds really cool. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of like we're gonna make it so we sleep six in the kitchen, and we're gonna use use it for the TV upstairs, like the TV station. And the idea will be when you know when a group's in town, they could come play live on TV. It would be tracked. They can destroy the tracks or take them with them. And my label's kicking ass. My distributors are kicking ass. You know, so I can put out anything I want. For anybody, the best deal in, in a freaking business, you know? 
Yeah, I'd, but, love, I'd love to come check it out. I mean, we're, we're touring until next April, pretty much. And then but that's not even a non-issue. We just want to do some... I just figure I can kick the shit out of Carson Daly. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to do it. And <laughs> another thing about this TV show is, check this out. This is an Anton... First of all, I don't even care about being a presenter. I just got high one day, and it occurred to me that I could do this. But um, <laughs> the, the thing that I'm interested in is... Uh, you know, not waiting around for permission from people to have a better life. And now, I, I travel all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't fool me. You can't fool me that there's, there's, the way things are is the way it's wanted to be. I mean, if, it's, if, 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 a, if a bonehead like me can, can figure out how to do all this stuff, there should be millions of people right now that could do this, but... There's bad media everywhere. There's just no good TV. Like, if you you ever hear about 120 Minutes, gosh, when you were a baby or something, didn't they? Back in the days in the 80s and stuff, they used to have a, an indie program on MTV yeah. with this guy, where it was all just stuff, you know? What was the name of the guy? Matt Soren, I okay. think. No, not Matt Soren. Matt something. Matt Soren might be the drummer from Guns N' Roses. Matt something. Penfield? Yep. But anyway, I met him. He's actually he's he's a really he knows a lot about good music. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he's he's definitely into it. Yeah. But uh, so do you. You know what I mean? You've made more records than him, <laughs> right? Yeah. But uh, I'll I'll just extend that invitation. The thing that I you know I thought that was interesting about the studio and all that jazz is uh, you know, when you take money out of the equation for people, then. Oh, I was getting to, to the TV station. It isn't me trying to break into the American media market. This is just me doing something in, from an exotic location. Like, see, I don't care. The, the Germans don't have to like it, and the Americans don't have to like it. This is worldwide. It's a, it's a mixed media. And you can just do this for free in your own laptop. And I, I am doing it, but the weird thing is I can, I can do anything with this. Like, uh, we could grab one of your videos right now if we find one. I could just do it the simple, old-fashioned way. But I'm not going to put it on here because... We would, uh, uh, I'll play one later, but not while I'm recording because then somebody's just going to try and, and you can screw play your, You can just play music. Yeah, you you wanna you want. I mean, I'll, I'll cut to one of mine if you want to check it out. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, watch this for one second. We'll, we'll just grab an Anton song from the new record that isn't out yet. Um, let me find yeah. something good. Because I don't even know if you've heard any of this mumbo jumbo. I don't think I have. God, you're going to trip out maybe. <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh, because it's actually really, really nuts. Can't wait. Okay, well, you don't even, you can hold the suspension of disbelief. Let me just find something good for one second. I guess I'll go this way, because um, I have more than one way to grab songs. I just can't remember where I put this thing. Okay, that's one in Russia. I've been recording in all these different languages, because you guys are talking, uh, yeah. Let's see. Should we, let me just find it this way really quick. Um, but I didn't really want this to be about me right now as interviewing you, but we could just do this anyways. So, you know. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just find uh, uh, waking up to hand grenades or something. King. Okay. Are you ready for this? Mumbo Jumbo? Let, let me find it. Okay. Cancel this. Turn on our speakers, and here's waking up to hand grenades. Let's see what he thinks of this.
the good news It's finally here Okay, we're back. Let me kill this. Let me see what kind of question I got. Um, you have any questions for me? <laughs> well, so how close are you to finishing the studio? That's the thing. I got these like rich white guy problems, right? I don't even want to complain about it. The thing is it has to be up to code. So the builders have to soundproof because we don't want them turning around. There's no neighbors, but... We don't want anybody having any excuses. Um, the equipment, you know, I set up a recording studio when I did, like, did the last album. I made a phone call, and you know, the business tax ID, whatever, through my my I've been on the LTD in the UK. Man, they delivered that recording studio, twenty three channels of Neve, everything I needed, set up in the middle of this orchestra room from a DDR old building. Mm -hmm just delivered there in a truck set up the next day. So, I mean, I could have a studio up and running in a day. It's just a matter. This time I'm not renting that kind of pro setup. Like the same thing if Daniel Lenoir, you guys were going to record with him or something, which I would suggest one day just for the hell of it, mm -hmm. under a live context. If you guys were ever going to do like a as is thing, somebody like that, or Nigel Goodrich, of course, is like the guy. Yeah. But once you make that move, you know, like, Sea changes. Beck will never have an album that sounds better than that. You can't sound better than that in today's technology. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But you, you, you know, Amnesiac. They're never, they're never gonna have a better sounding record. But so once you make that move, you know, it's kind of weird to go backwards. You know. But. You know what I mean, yeah. Um. So we, we definitely want to do some like full band live stuff. Um. Next time we record. Very cool. Because I'm just dealing with all just really old gear and really new stuff. So if you think about the Beatles, I can do anything that the Beatles can do, but also I have all the new goodies that they never even had a chance to fuck yeah. around with. It's just your perspective. Because it isn't just the gear, like what, Lenny Kravitz spent all that time building that crazy studio, buying the exact same EMI decks and everything. What did he do? Fucking covered American woman shitty, you know? It's like, so this is just about the gear. I can't tell you all the people I know that are just stockpiling all the good stuff and they, they don't have an idea to save them, their lives. Um, now let's see. Who, who was the, the one person so far or maybe a couple people so far that said, hey man, I like what you're doing? Like one of your heroes. You get any feedback from somebody you really respect in the biz? Well, I mean, obviously Peter Kimber sure. and then um, Jennifer Harriman was a big deal sure. for us because we were, we were huge Royal Chucks fans sure. and like to hear her say that she loves our music was like a big confidence booster. She's a force of nature too, huh? Um, I mean, meeting Kevin Shields was really cool. What a guy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Were uh, you all tongue-tied a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was... Yeah, he's something. exactly that same way with people too, though. Yeah. Did that blow you away a little bit? It did, definitely. Because I think that, like, 
Did you mean his sister? She, no, she I pops just, up a lot. Him and I think people kind of like. I I don't know. We were talking about this in the band, like you know, people like Jennifer and, and Pete and Kevin. I feel like you know, people that don't know them and are all just just know their music kind of can like build them up to be these like super like almost elite like cool yeah. figures but really they're just like all about making good music and I tell good everybody and, like, everybody's always asking me like how did you get this fucking idea how do you how do you have 20 albums out and just come up with this kind of new songs and stuff and I go oh yeah well me and Jason Pearson we all subscribe to this ma magazine called somebody ought to do this sometime and it, it's really elite <laughs> you know it's like it's like a Masonic type thing we just this magazine of good ideas that you guys aren't hip to <laughs> yeah. You know, you have to be in the club to to get that one. But no, it's just funny. Yeah. So, uh, what about festivals? You got some big plans coming up. We did some good festivals this year. We did, we played. Um, well, you said you're going to tour till summer, so that. Yeah, we're playing this Australian festival, Future Music Festival. What's well, summer right now down there? Down there, yeah. Um, and then we're we're going to Southeast Asia for the first time. Yeah, like we're getting a lot of invites to Jakarta and Hong Kong and. We got a lot of fans that watch this in Indonesia and some of these places too. Yeah, all over the world. I don't really cool. Let's see if we can take a question from the chat room if any of you guys are listening. But well, we're going to carry on because there is a lag. But um, let me think. Uh, what's what's the downside? What what can what what's the one thing about touring or whatever that you really can't? It really gets on your nerves that you have to struggle with to just go. Okay, you're, this is still worth it for me. I don't know. I mean, I guess the biggest thing is just only being in a city for, you know, like Missing three quarters of a day mm -hmm. and you just, you'll meet all these great people and just have a great time but you have to go and then it's, that's it. And then, you know, a few days later you've forgotten all about it, kind of. So, um, you know, that's the big thing and, and then I think just, uh, I think you have to be careful of not getting swept up into this kind of, I don't know. Just the, the lifestyle that, like, you, you can start. Everybody like, wants to party you down because it's easy. It's the easiest way they can think of to get backstage is to have a big bag yeah. of coke or booze or whatever. And it's for the, for the people in the cities. It's like it's a big deal. It's a big night for them. But for you, it's kind of just like another another place. And that sounds like cliche or whatever, yeah. but it's it's true. And like, um, you know, what's really weird about me is if I try, if I even talk to every single person or try to even talk every day to people on tour, I would lose my voice in three days. Yeah. Just from people wanting to like just chat with you. I mean I try and just always keep it really real. Everybody knows that about me, but still I have to cut people off. And you know what really sucks <laughs> too is I'll be talking to somebody like I was in Australia and I met John Saffron came to our show and he's this comedian guy who's mm -hmm. just hilarious from Melbourne originally. But um you you can't even talk to somebody who comes out of their way to see you because people will just be like blah 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 interrupting you. Yeah, it's so totally, frustrating totally. sometimes because I don't want to be that dick guy and I don't want to like go to some VIP club and hang out with Paris Hilton and shit. Some amazing weird shit happened to me like you know um, when we played Lollapalooza and we had like one of the stages and they uh, you know they offered me the same amount of money to, to play in front of 35,000 people at those 150 dollar tickets or whatever. They offered me the same amount of money to play in a private club, so all the fucking movie stars and shit could hang out yeah. and see you up close because they can't all be on the side of the stage. <laughs> and then they offered me the same amount of money just to DJ with an iPod, which is it's so insulting, don't you think? It is like, you're really going to offer me like $10,000 to I press play on my iPod? That is weak. If you can do it, though, I've been having a lot of fun DJing in my living room with like a shitty virtual DJ program sure. and like you can really, I don't know, I've been having a lot of fun like, you know, just mixing the songs and like, not even mashups, but just like, you know, slowing stuff down, yeah. just like simple EQ up. stuff and syncing stuff up and like, I don't know, just making like new crazy shit and it's a lot of fun, but I don't think, I've tried to do it like in a public cool. place once and it just doesn't work, people don't like it. Yeah, you guys, you guys live it up being DJs right now and all that shit because guess what, man, when the power goes out for good, I'm going to kick your asses with folk music. Yeah, well, and that's my that's my main, that's my go-to when I'm on my. You guys own. all be air wookie wookie, and I'll just be like. Pfft. I've been all about Towns song. Van Zant recently. Yeah, man, we should listen to a Towns Van Zant song, huh? Yeah, you should play for the sake of this. No, I'd rather play "Waiting Around to Die." All right. I can't do it right now because this is recording. Oh, okay. If I leave this on here, what what they're gonna do is they're not gonna. They, these these internet people they just they just 
delete your account, they don't have a whole legal team like sending me a letter to see my permission slip from Towns' estate. That have, I, you, have you seen that video on YouTube? Of, it's from a documentary, but of Towns are playing Wait Around and Die, and it's like this like old black man in the back that starts crying. Have you seen that? It's no. Really, it's really intense. It's like it's he was like from 1970. It, though, right? Yeah, he felt. I mean, it was like. It I feel it hard. too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great one. That song with Codeine and all that shit. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the classics. What a guy! What a guy! So, are you gonna avoid all those pitfall pitfalls? So I mean, because you seem like you're like I, I'm sensitive only in the sense of like, man, you, you kind of understand my perspective when I bring up a subject or we're talking about some of these things. You. You can empathize. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've done a good job. Like, we're playing as a five-piece live band, and I think we, we do a good job of keeping each other from, like, you know, those pitfalls, like you said, like, you know, going drug down abuse like, and whatever. dark, hard drug. It could be anything, animals, man. But, um, but, I mean, like... It could be anything. You know, the fucking porno sex or whatever. It could be a million yeah. things, right? It is, yeah. I mean, I think we, we smoke a lot of pot. So what? We don't care. It's kind of like... You seem like a good good uh, young man to me. <laughs> I mean, I know, I've come in contact with a lot of people. You know, I don't have a problem. I don't, think, you, you know, I don't view you as a radical. <laughs> no. But, um, so, you're going to go for another... Did the... Let me think, six months? You know, not quite January. Um, does it look like the label Columbia is going to exercise the next option, the next record? We still have one more... Solid. Uh, oh, it's, it's solid. Yes, yeah. three. There's okay. three, and then and then three two firm. options. So in business. We still have one more to, to do our uh, whatever yeah. we want. <laughs> Look, I don't want to spoil the surprise or anything, but um, do you have you know, have you guys been talking about an angle of what you want to approach? Well, we definitely know that it's going to be self-titled because we think that's funny. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Because because like you know, self-titled third album, I think it's pretty like cliche rock thing to do and um I don't know I think that uh I think it's gonna be good you know I think it's gonna be like we had a the second album was just kind of weird for us it, I think we're really happy with it but just the whole like whatever around do you it really just, care if I tell you that I like your band or I don't like it I don't care no right well you should cause I got more power than anybody I just don't I just don't show people the same way you'd be surprised well, that's cool, man. I mean, like, um, you know, do you like, I just like... No, I didn't say that. I was just, <laughs> what I was, well, I wasn't talking about me. I was talking about, like, you know what I mean? If Pitchfork doesn't give you a oh, that, 10 no. or something, it's not going to wreck your day. I'm, I'm totally cool cruising in our, like, 6.8 level, which we... Because <laughs> I think it's, like, you know... It's so great. Bands that get, like, 10s or whatever, they're, sure. uh... It's kind of... Kind of a weird. I don't know. I hate to, to give Pitchfork Media that much power. Fuck them. Merge but, uh, Records can suck me. But you know, I mean, I'm just kidding. So many of the records that they give bad ratings to, I love. Shit. So who cares? Yeah. Well, I think you just got the healthiest attitude, because man, it's so weird. Like I hate to name drop, but you know, like say like your BMRC and then your old drummer is getting greatest drummers of all time, Centerfold and Enemy, boy, you really wonder what happened when your record company drops you and you're not, you can't get arrested and you put out a record of acoustic stuff and you can't even get an Enemy and you go, wait a minute, what happens? You, you just said we're the greatest thing of all time and they don't realize that it wasn't, that the writers don't decide this shit yeah. in these magazines. Well, Enemy, like, they totally, they kind of screwed us over on this last record because they... I'm just here to tell you, I had a, my, me and my sister had a subscription in 78 for Enemy, okay, 1978, uh -huh. all right? If you <laughs> took their advice of everything that they said was great, man, I'll just go right back. We can look up any of those articles back to the 60s, man. They're not even batting a fucking 4% success rate on them calling what's good. <laughs> so you got to take it, like, historically. If yeah. You just look like the stock market, man. Those guys didn't even do good as anything at, get, at calling what's, what's going to be popular or what's going to stand the test of time. So I don't want to hear how great Wings is or something from these guys. So I don't take that hard, you know? Yeah. To me, it's super encouraging that you said you're going to follow through um, because it's cool. 
I think it's uh, admirable, you know, but the one thing you got to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter how good you are at rowing a boat, if, if you have a hole in your boat and, and the water's coming faster than you can bail, you're going to sink. Sure. You know, and a lot of people get confused about, well, I'm going to carry on doing this thing that doesn't work forever. I mean, that's like this, but I don't, I don't see you guys as having that problem. Um, and let me think about something else. Boy, this is, this is decent. It, out of the blue, we, we had another call tonight that was great, you know? Um, shoot. I w oh, yeah, I wanted to ask somebody in, in the chat room if any of you guys have any questions for management or a representative of, of, of MGMT. I mean, I mean do, you, do you guys have anything you want to know? <laughs> to produce our next album. No, we, don't need the, <laughs> we don't need their suggestions. We, what, we, what we need is basically um, a question if anybody's got one. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, wait, it says, you were talking earlier about the label operates between album one and album two. You felt any frustrations how to express them? Do you understand this question, how he framed it? We felt any frustrations. They love your necklace, Andre. Show them your necklace up close. Oh, yeah, this is a cool necklace. That's a it's a Masonic necklace, Andre. Very cool. There you go. Yeah, the Eye of Horus. <laughs> okay, let's see. Well, um, we already got that question. Okay, what does it say? What kind of philosophy of educational... Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, he's a teacher, I think. Oh, okay. No, maybe not. She's actually got... to somebody... Oh, wait. He already told you um, how, he, how he keeps grounded. He said that, you know... He, it was never his goal to be on the label anyway, so he didn't know what he was missing to begin with. He was just like, fuck it, we're just going to go about it this way. Because he, he wasn't worried about what he was going to be in danger of losing by being, you know, by pursuing his own whims. See, he said he, he would, it was never his intention to play that game anyways. He just like, well, fuck it. And also with a prejudice about being indie or the label having a suggestion, like, a lot of people don't know. A lot of people think just because... Uh, black angels are on light in the attic or something. You don't get on fucking David Letterman by being on some fucking rinky dink indie label. That's a major label. You just don't know it. See? But they're all worried about you knowing that. I mean, they're my friends, but I'm not worried about telling it to you. But none of this shit happens by accident. And he, and he just said he didn't have any of that kind of pretension, even if they thought it was like the best way to market. See, a lot of people don't know Vice Magazine is just American apparel. They just think, oh, well, whatever. You know, these are just these zany guys. It's fucking marketing. Yeah. Anyways, uh, maybe I missed a question, but did you, did you understand what he said, or did I just talk right through your... No, I, I, I think you, uh, you said it right there. Yeah. Right, he, they're just kind of enjoying their trip. It's true. So, to me, that seems like a rock-solid attitude. Cause We've gotten to, you know, meet and work with, like, some of our people that we've always wanted to meet and work with. Like, you know, Sonic yeah. Boom... And Tracy, Jennifer Harma, Dave Fridman, and like, I don't know, that's just, I think that, I think while, you know, a lot of critics, like, didn't like our second album, I think the, the real thing is like going to these shows that are like selling out and seeing these fans that really love it, and that's kind of, you know, giving us the kind of push to keep doing what sure. we want to do. Sure, the win for yourself. The honest approach, yeah. Man, I was just going to say something that's pretty interesting. Uh... It'll come to me in a minute. I got so much on my mind. You know, uh, okay, what I was going to say is like, you know, we're not advocating the destruction of the sewer system uh, or something. I don't have any problem with m major labels. I just know that they're not run right. It's obvious to me. Like, if those guys had a good idea, they would be on it. They don't really have a really good idea. And for me, what else, when you were saying um, about these people you worked with, for me, that's been gold. Like having Johnny Marr show up at shows, you know? Having him tell Rob, Rob, that he loves us. All these guys, you know, being friends with all these guys. Having Kevin standing right next to me when we're headlining. Um, having, having, you know, Kevin Shields right next to me at, at Shepherd's Bush Empire. That kind of stuff to me is gold because I just love... 
love those guys, you know? So to me, that's better than having uh, some magazine tell me that I'm the shit or that I suck. It's just like having people that I love enjoy the, the art too, you know? That's, that's, that's to me yeah, that's, what, what it's all about. Yeah, it's, it's hard not to be swayed by, you know, negative press or like just start reading it all about yourself but like that's what you can fall back on is your, your peers and the people that you really respect saying that they because they don't like need to what say you're doing. It. yeah it's, it's they're not worried about getting fired if they're not nice to you right yeah you know or something well i wish more people would just speak their mind about things sometimes i know that a minimum of decorum is expected of you as a public figure but we've just done ourselves a massive disser disservice by everybody saying they like stuff, you know, like everybody kissing up to Lady Gaga because they think, you know, Elton John thinks he's not going to ever, young people won't listen to his music or something if he doesn't say that he likes that stuff. It's just, I don't understand that kind of behavior at all, unless he's really that twisted, then that wouldn't surprise me either. But, um, um, so let me think. Very cool. Do you guys got any idea about who you want to work with as a producer? I, when I put that out there, I wasn't really ta thinking about, um, trying to put my name in, in the ring. What I was talking about more was, you know, if you guys are ever in town or in, under any context, if you ever want to mess around. Yeah, that would be cool. That Will and I would be more than ha happy. You know, I have my own engineer. Yeah. Because uh, I, I do the Phil Spector thing, you know? Like, I like to get some people in a room and go, this is what I would like to see happen now. You know what I mean? Yeah, that'd be great. I yeah. mean, yeah, we haven't really even gotten to the point of thinking about who the world is producer. We, we still, you know, for the first... Our both the albums we put out, we're, Ben and I and my bandmate are really producing the albums ourselves. Sure. And we have, you know, Dave Friedman who's mixing it with us and Pete Kimber who is kind of co producing. But sure. Like, Ben and I are the ones arranging everything and, like, just like controlling what we want it to sound like and what we want the songs to be. Did you ever feel like that when you had that kind of hands on thing that you could accept if it like, was a failure then? But you could, you maybe, like, as an artist, it's harder to accept if somebody else fucks up your career? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if I try my hardest, at least I know absolutely that I tried my hardest. And it wasn't somebody else's, you know, weird call that they made. Like, oh, we got to sound like this guy or something. Yeah. I don't know. I just think it's... How about your management? What kind of management you guys got? That's a good question. Yeah. Management of the management. Well, I mean, like, uh, we got great managers. I know. Honestly, um, I wouldn't have seen you on these, like, they're call and request video shows in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think they, they really they really fight for us with the label and and um, they do their they do their job well. So I think we're we're really happy with that. I think sometimes like you know it's weird to think about you know whatever band that's on a major label sure. and they have all these people that are surrounding them and it's like sometimes you, you can get paranoid like are are you in this bubble where everybody's telling you you're the Bubbles. shit yeah. but like really you're just a douchebag and like mm. and I think that we've done a good job of kind of just staying yeah you, like I said true I'm, and like, I'm, uh, not, I'm not kidding when I said it. it seems like you you got your head screwed on right you know did you ever read about did you ever read that book The Hitman or something like that where it talks about I've like, heard about it I haven't read it yeah, yeah the underside you know it's like Hunter S. Thompson and, uh, and I basically share this opinion like right. that the entertainment industry is this fucking cesspit that's filled with wreckage and detritus and they occasionally also create entertainment yeah. yeah and they also do that it's like this is pit of snakes in bones and dandruff and muck <laughs> and they also make films and, and records and sometimes occasionally one slips through what about that um have you guys met any filmmakers because you guys get into a little bit into the videos you're still interested in that stuff i mean um yeah i mean i really have I still want to meet uh, Werner Herzog. Of course. Like, <laughs> it would be really cool to meet him. Yeah. I want to meet, I mean, after seeing, I don't know if you saw Enter the Void. Did you see that movie? Mm -hmm. But I know exactly all about it. It's, I read uh, the books. it's just, um, I, I think that guy's like, pretty much on, like, the, the, ne the next level of, well, he's beyond the zeitgeist. Yeah. He's not, people aren't ready for that kind of shit. And um, I'd like to meet that director, Gaspar Noel. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we've, we've been really happy working with Ray's story. He's done, like, three of our videos, and um, that was great. What about, like, uh, what about if me and my mates in the business, what about, we've been talking about 
the possibility of setting up some really cool, we're, we've been talking about the possibility of maybe hijacking one of these other festivals where they don't really know what the fuck they've got going, but they kind of need to, like, if they want to stay in the game, do it right. Like what? Well, like, you name a festival that's kind of, doesn't really have a really good program, for, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, Blastonbury's be best idea is having Jay-Z come down. Right. But then, you know, my argument is... Last America could very easily be hijacked because there's so many crazy people there. <laughs> yeah, what, what I'm talking about <laughs> is getting some, some of these people, like, together and putting on a good show or a couple shows, you know, yeah. for people. Instead of, like, all this crap... Well, there could easily be a festival within a festival at Glastonbury, you know. And there is to a degree, but, like, you know, there could be Yeah, but stages. the BBC, <laughs> man, I hate to tell you, LaRue, I, I played the same year that LaRue played, and they played, like, in a coffee tent or something. And then they were on the BBC show back backstage, and then they were played on BBC as playing at Glastonbury ad infinitum, uh, infinity. And guess what? No coincidence that her mom is a presenter on the BBC. But, um, you know... The thing is, is like, there's some weird hokey pokey going on because, for my money, Leonard Cohen kicked everybody's ass at that festival a little bit. So, it's just weird that what, what came out of it was Biff Bang Pow, I mean, uh, you got that boom, 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 Black Eyed Peas oh, yeah. breaking the UK and LaRue. And it had nothing to do with any of the good bands playing. So, I don't know what their problem is. But what, but the, the thing that I do notice is that, that the law enforcement and the conservative members of society are not in the mood for any public gatherings of lots of young people together for any reason. So that's the only thing we got working with. Because so then we'll have to dedicate the police and the resources to that because the money's not there. Yeah. But um, what did you think of Oxygen and all the Irish stuff, festivals? You guys play that yet? Yeah, we did that like the first year we were touring. Okay. And, um, they don't really have their shit together so much, do they? I don't know. I mean, it's Oxygen and, and uh, Tea and Park are kind of the same festival. Yeah. And, you play one, that, one day. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think we had, we had really fun shows there, but I don't. It was kind of like when we were still new to playing festivals, yeah. so it wasn't really our thing. Um, I'm I'm so much more comfortable playing in a smaller club, you know. I think that the whole band is like that. Did and you guys play Garden Neff Party or whatever? Mm -hmm. The one in France, they have one. Uh, I want to say it's an Agum, Agum, but uh, Agume. <laughs> I can't pronounce the word. But anyways, uh, and it's amazing, it's in this, on the edge of a forest, so if you play the one stage, you're like right on the edge of the trees and everybody's in this meadow. Oh, that's nice. It's just spectacular. Fuji Rock Festival was really cool, actually. Yeah, those guys are cool over there in Japan, that yeah. was great. That was great fun. Yeah. Um, well, I know you want to get back down to drinking and partying with your friends, because they already called on you. But I gotta thank you so much for making this yeah, time. That was great. <laughs> You're really cool. Yeah, it's cool. It makes me feel good about the future when guys that are younger than me um, kind of know what they're they're doing. You know. Try to try to stay. You know. Don't, don't try. Know. Try these lying. Just do it. Just doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It also makes me feel good when I see some older guys that are just have their heads screwed on yeah. few years down the road for me because they're just holding the torch so I can see the path. For me. Totally. You know? But now that I know where your head's at, uh, you know, you can count on me for any kind of help in any way. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. You know, I mean, like, fuck if your aunts get stolen or anywhere you are in the world, I know people, you know? Yeah. It's always a good thing. I know that, you, you know, you can just call a rental company or whatever to have them send it out. But sometimes with the specific shit, it's not that easy. So I'll extend that to you. And we got this on tape. And also, I'll look, I'll look for your guys' as a. Uh, Whatever, I'll post this thing. We'll figure this out. Maybe Kate, Katie will stay in contact with you. And this, this will just exist. And people refer back to this and post these just like YouTubes. So we'll, we were going to play something now. So I'm just going to end this, this recording part. And then I can play whatever I want. See?